Um, good morning and welcome to the ICMA webinar on the Securities Financing Transaction Regulation. My name is uh, Richard Camotto and um, I will be conducting uh, this session. So um, just to set the background, we aim to provide a fairly rounded picture of SFTR. We will refer to um, Asian concerns um, as, as we come across them. Um, we think this webinar will last about an hour and uh, at the end of that we'll have about half an hour set aside for Q&As. You'll be able to ask Q&As by voice or you'll be able to type them in and we'll explain what to do uh, when we get to the end of the session. So uh, just to set the scene, um, I spend a lot of my time at the moment with ICMA um, trying to interpret and provide advice to member firms and other participants in the industry about how to report under SFTR. And this will obviously impact on the counterparties of EU entities, and that's why we're conducting this webinar. Now, what we will not be covering, let's get that out of the way first, is uh, why SFTR exists, so its origins in the work of the Financial Stability Board, and uh, we will not be looking at the history. We're basically saying we are where we are, so let's just talk about the present. And I should also point out that SFTR has three articles, 13, 14, and 15, which deal with the disclosure of information about SFTs by investment firms to their clients. It also includes disclosure about the use of total return swaps. There are information and consent requirements in Article 15. If you transact with a counterparty and they give you collateral through title transfer, then you have to warn them of the risks and general consequences of doing so and you have to have their express written consent. So these are um, important articles. They have been in place since July 2017 and I would note that they apply not just to SFTs, they actually apply to all collateral arrangements. But what we're going to, what we're going to focus on is merely the reporting side, so transaction reporting. Now we'll look first at um, SFTR resources, so what you can refer to. We will then um, go through the when, what, who and how of reporting, so that's the detail, and then we'll add on to transaction reporting, reuse and CCP margin reporting, and then of course the session for Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, please, I hope you can hold them till the end, and of course after the webinar, after the Q&A, you're welcome to contact me or ICMA with further questions. So let's have a look at the resources available to you, the documents you should be using as a reference. Um, some of those will be provided by ICMA. We run a task force. Uh, you can dial into that, uh, those meetings. We hold them every couple of weeks. And I've given the contact name there, Alexander Vesfal, and uh, open to member firms and non-member firms. We publish at the moment what we're calling an annex to the guide to best practice in the European repo market. This is just an annex on SFTR reporting. In fact, it's become so large, about 130 pages, that we have decided to publish it as a standalone document. Um, and that we propose to do in about a month's time. So this is a list of currently about 60 recommendations addressing various aspects of reporting. And uh, it's available to task force members. You can, it's, it's not a confidential document, but it is still a work in progress. The, the current version is available to anybody who's registered on the task force. We also provide a set of sample SFTR reports, so for specific types of repo, we set out the data that will have to be provided. There are currently 36 samples. And then we provide a map of repo lifecycle events to the SFTR reporting types. We constantly represent the views of industry to the regional regulator, the lead regulator, ESMA, and we have a list of outstanding open questions with, with them, which we add to occasionally, and once in a while we even get an answer. We participate in various trade association, uh, supergroup. Um, there are a number of other associations obviously working in this, ISLA for securities lending, AFME for margin lending, and so on. We cooperate with them quite closely. We participate in a, in a supergroup, as it's called, 
and we also participate in a fix working group which is trying to ensure that the fix protocol uh, is able to report what's required in SFTR. We run an open line for industry questions. You can email or call. We receive about a dozen queries each day on various aspects of SFTR. And we occasionally run repo reporting workshops. And the webinar is our current effort to reach out to the industry to ensure everybody knows what's happening. As far as official documents are concerned, you must obviously start with a copy of the let what's called the level one regulation uh, the regulation itself and um, whatever is in there cannot be changed by in response to industry comment no matter how wrong it is or how unworkable we're stuck with that for several years ahead uh, there was a publication which had no legal status called the final report and that provided the commentary from esma the lead regulator um, on how sftr would be implemented that is still quite relevant. There's a lot of information there, but it also raised large numbers of questions. There was a document called Validation Rules. This is uh, a detailed field by field um, set of rules that uh, how you fill each field in. Now, this particular one, the one issued in October 2016, has been replaced by an update. We'll come to that in a minute, so we'll forget that. And then we come to a set of documents called RTSs and ITSs. So these are the implementing um, regulations. They are called level two. So they implement the level one SFTR itself. And what is particularly important is the annexes to those. They list the fields, the formats, the rules that apply to filling out the fields. And just to emphasize that like the regulation itself, if something is written down in these RTSs and ITSs, it's not going to change for the next few years. Um, on, in May, ESMA issued a consultation paper on reporting guidelines. So that is supplementing the um, previous paper, the final report, providing further commentary and some more specific examples. And it was helpful in many respects as far as it went. But we are now waiting for the final reporting guidelines, which we are told are due sometime in Q4, which we're of course in. Um, I'm afraid many people feel that we're not going to see these till December, but we don't really know. There is a board meeting of ESMA on the 3rd of December, and it's maybe that that's the board meeting that approves the final reporting guidelines. Um, so December it looks the best bet. It's not very long in advance of the actual implementation date, unfortunately. And then consolidated validation rules. This is the update. So this is a very important working document if you're trying to understand how to fill out individual fields. Um, I've mentioned the final reporting guidelines, we think now December, but we don't really know. And the consolidated validation rules may well be updated as well. There are a number of problems with the rules. From 2020, we may see occasional Q and A's being issued by ESMA. Um, they've done this for EMIR, they've done this for MIFID, and this will provide further detail. But of course, this will be too late for people trying to build systems to meet the start date. Okay, so let's get into the reporting itself. When, um, there are four waves, four start dates, depending what sort of firm you are. If you are a bank or investment firm, it's supposed to be the 11th of April. That actually is Easter Saturday. So ESMA think they may well shift the date um, a short distance to avoid Easter weekend. And then you'll see CCPs and CSDs coming in three months later, then the buy side three months after that, and finally corporates three months after that. But I would note that most of the CCPs in Europe have said they will start reporting from the in the first wave. Um, this is supposed to be a dual-sided reporting regime. So if two entities are liable to report under SFTR, their reports will be matched. Well, obviously, if you are a bank dealing with a buy side client, you will report from April 2020, but your client won't report from October. So dual reporting won't work until your client starts reporting. In addition to reporting transactions that you do after your start date, you're also going to have to report historic transactions. So this is to allow the regulator to calculate the outstanding stock of SFTs. Um, and what's been decided is this will be done six months, approximately six months after the go live date 
whatever that is for your type of institution. And in fact, 180 days after the go live date. So if let's say you're a bank, um, 180 days after your April start date, you've got to look at any historic deals that you did before your go live date, before April. And you, if they are still live, you may have to report them. So open transactions that were open before you started reporting that are still live 180 days later, you'll have nine days to report them. You have to report them by go live plus 189. <clears throat> and then any fixed term transactions that you transacted before your go live date that are still live 180 days later, you have to report those as well. But there you can report them earlier if you wish. So on the go live date, if you identify fixed term transactions that you negotiated prior to that date that have more than 180 days to maturity, you can report those at once. Okay, you don't have to wait 180 days to see if they're still alive. Um, if you don't report until later, until the end of this uh, six month period, you don't have to provide reports of any modifications or terminations. It's only once these transactions are actually up back loaded, as, as we're calling it, you'll have to start to treat them like normal um, SFTs that you report after the go live date. Um, in order to report these historic transactions, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you're going to have to add unique transaction identifiers to them. They probably don't already have them. There's a lot of other SFTR data that will have to be provided and there will be a matching requirement as well at some point. So um, the theory is that on go live plus 190, the regulator should have a very good impression of the out stock of outstanding SFTs. This is uh, a calendar for the backloading. That's just for reference. We won't spend any time talking about it now. Okay, what do you have to report? Well, we're focusing on repo. Um, repo is one of the instruments that are classed as an SFT. Um, repo has in fact been split into two, repurchase transactions and buy sellbacks. So this is a rather unnecessary um, distinction that has been made. The only difference between repurchase transaction and buy sellback is what happens when income is paid on the collateral. So if your collateral is a bond and a coupon is paid under repurchase transaction, that coupon will be paid by the issuer of the collateral to the buyer and the buyer is liable to pay an equivalent sum, which we usually refer to as the manufactured payment, is obliged to pay that to the seller on the same day as the coupon is paid. In the case of a buy-sell back, there is no manufactured payment. Instead, the payment of the coupon on the collateral is anticipated by lowering the repurchase price of the repo. So the seller gets the value of the coupon not by means of a manufactured payment on the coupon date, they get the value back by paying less back to the buyer on the repurchase date. Now that's the sole difference between these two types of transaction, but um, ESMA for some reason thinks they're two distinct types of repo. So we have those, we have securities lending and borrowing, and included in that is commodities lending and borrowing, and then finally margin lending, so what prime brokers do with hedge funds. And that's actually um, makes the whole process rather difficult because this is a one size fits all regime. And these are rather different types of activity. Um, just to note, if you look in SFTR, the definitions that are given of repurchase transaction and buy sell backs are both incorrect, factually incorrect. So don't use them for any other purpose, um, but they are there. Uh, synthetic repos where we might, for example, sell collateral in an outright trade and simultaneously put in place a total return swap to move the risk and return back to the seller okay, to mimic what um, a repo would do. These are not reportable. Uh, investment firms do have to disclose their use of the total return swap to their clients, but there is no reporting requirement to regulators. Um, so they won't know the size of the synthetic repo market. Um, the argument is that uh, the derivative side is already reported under the EMEA regulation. We also have instruments such as liquidity swaps and collateral swaps. So for example, I may have a stock of illiquid asset-backed securities and I require high quality liquid assets to meet my liquidity coverage ratio. Um, what I do is I repo out the 
illiquid assets, I take the cash and then I return the cash in exchange for government securities. Or I could simply do a securities loan where I send illiquid securities and get government securities back as collateral. Um, both of these are not specifically identified as collateral liquidity swaps. You just report the individual components. So if it's a back-to-back -back repo and reverse repo, you report each transaction. You, there's no linkage has to be reported between them. And if you report them as a securities loan, it'll look like any other securities loan. We've, um, in our discussions, uh, come up with a few rather odd transactions, and some of them, in fact, quite sizable in terms of market share. And one of these is a reverse stock loan or reverse securities loan. This is, in fact, reported currently, well, currently it would be reported as a securities loan. And it is documented under a, security, a securities lending master agreement, such as the Jimsler. The problem is that uh, if we look at the structure, it is a portfolio of securities, I've got six in the diagram there, and a single pool of cash. And unlike most securities loans, the cash um, is kept constant and it's the security value that is varied in order to eliminate any exposure. Now, in fact, this is really a repo. Um, the reason why it is classed as a securities loan and documented under a securities lending master agreement is really because people have tried to incorporate repo into their securities lending systems rather than by buying specialist repo modules so this is a disguised repo now under sftr when you report a securities loan you can only report one security as being loaned well in our example we have six so we have a problem and we, the only way round it that has been suggested is that we actually do now report it as a repo and then this meet will provide us access to field cash fields and I've got uh, fields principal amount on value date and principal amount on maturity date. Um, this would allow us to report it, it would still be reported as under securities lending master agreement but it would actually switch to being identified as what it really is which is a repo. So we come up with quite a few of these odd uh, transactions. Now ESMA in their draft guidelines of May have uh, tried to um, refine the boundaries of SFTR and they're very keen to exclude certain um, types of activity. Now SFTRs are supposed to be something that might pose systemic risk. Um, they are largely instruments in which one party gets reuse of the other, uh, of, uh, of the collateral provided by the other. Um, so secured lending where there is lo money being loaned against a cash is really not supposed to be captured, particularly if it's retail client lending, which would be identified as no master agreement, but just subject to general consumer credit law. Private banking, Lombard loans, syndicated lending, other corporate loans, if these are secured uh, against uh, securities, then they're not really supposed to be reported under SFTR. Um, T2S auto collateralization is a facility provided by um, in the in the eurozone security settlement system um, if a, a buyer is temporarily short of cash to complete a, a settlement of a, of a purchase of a security the system will or the, the, their central bank will lend the money um, against collateral that is already held in the system um, a couple of central banks around the world offer this facility and this is also excluded, it's regarded as not um, an SFT in the, in, the, in the meaning of the sense that it was intended and it would just generate lots of noise. So this sort of facility is excluded. What is included is however facilities that lend securities if the, the seller temporarily has a shortage of the security they've sold um, in order to facilitate settlement then some settlement systems will automatically lend securities, again, against collateral. Um, uh, this is also included, but it will typically be a securities loan rather than a repo. We've got some special cases to deal with. Intraday loans, um, intraday repos, um, the loan side of the transaction is reported, but because the, they are intraday, there'll be no outstanding collateral at the end of the day so that isn't reported only part of this transaction is therefore going to be reported corporate events if the collateral changes character during the course of a transaction 
then we think that typically for repo, this will result in a change in the collateral, which is reported in what, what, what we'll see as a collateral update report. Um, it's not actually, in most circumstances, um, that's all that happens. Uh, if you are transacting a repo under the GMRA equity annex, then there may be occasions in which you have to report a termination of the transaction. Shaping, fails, partial deliveries and pair-offs, these are all settlement events. And the, the principle you should follow is that unless there is a contractual change underlying these events, you don't report them. So shaping would be where, for example, I have 200 million to deliver. I break it down into four shapes of 50 million purely for delivery purposes. The contract is still for 200 million. Then our guidance is that you report the 200 million. You don't worry about the fact that it's settled in four shapes of 50. Um, if somebody fails to deliver, in the case of a repo, you don't report that. The repo contract has not changed if somebody fails to deliver to you. So they are not reportable events. Partial deliveries, if somebody delivers part of what they're due to, again, we treat it as a fail. It doesn't change the nature of the contract, so don't report it. Uh, Pair-offs are a type of technical netting. So this is netting for delivery purposes or payment purposes. It is not um, a risk reduction. Uh, it is not a legal change. So if your back offices for convenience decide to net two opposite flows, uh, then that's ignored for the purposes of reporting. So just to emphasize, only contractual changes should be reported. Okay, who has to report? The general rule is that if you are trading from inside the EU, whether you are an EU incorporated entity or you're the branch inside the EU of a non-EU firm, for example, the London branch of a Singapore bank, okay, you have to report. In addition to that, if you are the branch outside the EU of an EU incorporated entity, so you could be the Singapore branch of a London bank, then you are also captured. So um, that's the basic rule. And then there are a couple of um, exceptions or exemptions. First of all, just to be clear that if you're a non-EU entity trading outside the EU, you're completely free. So the parent um, entity of, that's of a Singapore bank has no reporting obligation. It's outside the scope of the SFTR. Um, subsidiaries of EU entities located outside the EU. So if you have, um, if a Paris uh, French bank has a, a subsidiary incorporated in Hong Kong, which is, incorpor is incorporated in Hong Kong, that's free of SFTR. Um, you see there ESCB, European System of Central Banks. This is the 28 EU central banks and the European Central Bank. They do not have to report. Um, European debt management agencies do not have to report and the Bank for International Settlement don't have to report. So those are the only exemptions at the moment. We have a question in the Q&As about this, which we will come back to, about exemption for foreign central banks. And we'll come back to this point. Um, now, if you are a reporting entity, you're captured by the general rules that we saw in the previous slide, you don't have to report any intra-company transactions. So within the same LEI. If you deal with an EU central bank or the ECB, then you don't have to report that either. So they don't, the, the central bank doesn't report, you don't report. However, if you are nevertheless a reporting entity for other transactions, you don't report under SFTR. Unfortunately, you have to report it under the MIFIR regulation. So this is quite strange. Um, if you deal with a European debt management agency or the BIS, they don't have to report, but you do. And then finally, SFTR brought in what's called delegated reporting, and this has also been subsequently added to the EMIR regulation. Uh, if you are an EU financial counterparty, so you're uh, an entity subject to SFTR, and you deal with what is called a small non-financial entity in the EU, then their reporting obligation is delegated to you. If you are a USIT, which is an EU mutual fund, or you're an AIF, which is a European and EU hedge fund, then reporting on behalf of these entities is delegated to their managers. A lot of people will be voluntarily dele delegating their reporting um, obligations as well. They'll be outsourcing them to third party providers. Uh, 
So what we've referred to in those first two bullet points are mandatory delegation. There will be voluntary delegation as well. A um, number of market associations, including ICMA, are involved in drafting what is called a master regulatory reporting agreement. This will be a template that anybody can use to document um, either their the decisions they made about how they're going to do mandatory delegation or their arrangements for voluntary delegation. And that will be published, <clears throat> we believe, this month. We've got a little um, decision um, flow chart there that uh, you can work through. Um, I leave it there for reference. Um, we, we won't go through it now. Okay, what is a small EU non-financial entity? Um, the definition derives from the EU accounting directive and basically if you deal with somebody in the EU that has a balance sheet less than 20 million, turnover less than 40 million um, and employees less than 250 million, if two of those three criteria are met they are a small non-financial entity. Um, if you deal with them then the question is what if they change? Uh, if they're not a small financial entity when you start dealing then they suddenly become one, do you have to take over the responsibility? Um, our interpretation is at the moment that given that the definition is based on the EU accounting directive that you only have to do this once a year when the new annual accounts are published but we are still waiting for guidance. Um, there's a chart there showing um, obligations. Any box in red has to report and any of the lines in red have to be reported and you can relate that back to the rules we saw earlier. So if you are um, this EU financial entity let me just see if I can get the laser pointer to work. Yeah. So if you're this entity here, you're clearly you're in the EU, you're subject to reporting. If you deal with an EU debt management office, they don't have to report, but you do. If you deal with an EU central bank, they don't report. And because this line is blue, it's showing that you don't have to report. If you are an EU entity abroad, you have to report uh, anything you do with anybody else. But obviously, if you're an EU subsidiary or you're a non-EU entity, then you're outside the regulation. One question that is particularly relevant to Asian counterparties, uh, or other, in fact, Asian, the, the branches of Asian banks in the EU, if you, for example, you had a London branch, um, can it avoid SFTR reporting if its transactions are booked with the parent outside the EU? So let's say you're the branch in London of a Singapore bank, um, if you book your SFTs with your Singapore parent, can you avoid SFTR? Now, if we look at SFTR itself, the original regulation, I think that was fairly clear. It said you have to report, even if you're established in a third country, if the SFT is concluded in the course of the operations of a branch in the union. So it doesn't matter about what role you played, if you play any role, I think that rather captured you. However, ESMA have subsequently issued some guidance on what they mean by the word conclusion. And we see these four criteria, A, B, C, and A, B, C, and D. Um, ignore D, it's just saying doesn't matter where the transaction is executed. If we read through these and think about them carefully, what it actually comes down to is you are captured by SFTR. If you are that London branch of a Singapore bank, if you execute the transaction and um, sorry, if the transaction is a client order or if you've created the SFTR, uh, the SFT, because you, are, you have decision, investment decision making powers, you have a mandate to do that, then you will have to report it. This then raises the question, what if that London branch of the Singapore Bank isn't dealing with client orders and the orders aren't the result of an investment mandate? it would appear that they fall outside the reporting regulation. But we are not sure. We are waiting for um, some further clarification from ESMA. If you are reporting the reuse of collateral, which you're required to, the rules are very similar to the transaction reporting with a couple of uh, differences. That there is a suggestion the way that the SFTR is drafted that if you are outside the EU and you receive collateral from an EU entity, then you will have to report your reuse. We don't think this is intended. We don't think this is practicable. So we're basically saying just ignore it. If you're not subject to SFTR, we don't think this rule can be applied to you. 
Um, there is uh, one exception to the, the rule, don't report intra-company transactions. So for the purpose of reuse, if you are a branch inside the EU and your parent is outside or vice versa, any SFTs between you will have to be reported for reuse, but not the transaction itself. Exemptions are exactly the same as for uh, transaction reporting. And you'll see if you compare the diagrams. So what I raised about uh, that, that last exception, if you were this entity here and you received collateral from an EU entity, okay, the literal interpretation of SFTR is if you then reuse that collateral, you'd have to report that. But to say, we don't think that is what was intended and we don't think that would actually be workable. Okay, the how of reporting. When you send a report, you have to identify the purpose and it can be a new transaction or a new position. You can be changing the contractual terms of the deal. You can be terminating the deal. Um, all of these require new reports. Now, just to note, modification and termination. Um, it's a rather complicated um, situation. If you terminate, you only report as a termination if the termination is settled the same day. If, however, you decide to terminate a transaction and the settlement is, let's say, in two days' time or in seven days' time, you report that as a modification. This is one of the many practical complications in SFTR. All other changes in your contract, for example, changing the repo rate, would be modifications. There are also collateral updates that you have to provide probably every day. Um, any change in the value or composition of uh, collaterals, things like substitutions, valuation changes, these have their spe this special category collateral update. If you are receiving or giving margin to or uh, from a CCP, or you're uh, dealing with a clearing member of a CCP and they are clearing on your behalf, then there is a special set of reports for those. This does not cover bilateral variation margining. So if you and I are just transacting under the GMRA, we're not transacting through a CCP. There is no express provision for reporting that under SFTR. We've had to invent one, and we'll come back to that later. I've talked about reporting the reuse of collateral, and I've talked um, that that's, again, a special, we'll come back to that at the end, it's a special report. If you make any mistakes in reporting, you have to correct them, and if you make uh, a report that you shouldn't have, uh, because, for example, that you may be the European back office for an, uh, an organization that includes a New York office and they do a trade and it's accidentally captured by you and reported under SFTR, they're not liable to reporting. So you're going to have to go and destroy that report. And that's what error means. Now, to identify each of these events or each of these types of action, there are what are called action types. And for repo, there are 10 overall, but only nine of them apply to repo and you'll be seeing these um, as we go through the rest of the presentation. Reporting deadlines, most reports have to be in the day after the transaction itself. So if I transact today, Thursday, then I've got till midnight tomorrow, Friday, to um, submit the report. There are some exceptions. I may do a, a repo where I'm perhaps using a tri-party agent, I'm dealing cross-border, where I don't know the collateral allocation in time to make a report by T plus one, I am allowed to delay the reporting of the collateral. I have to report the loan in by T plus one, but the collateral, I can use a collateral update report and I have until S plus one to do that. Um, routine updates about the value and composition of collateral are also S plus one because what you're reporting is a balance, outstanding balance. And obviously you don't know what that is until the settlement date itself. So you're given until settlement plus one to do the report. Um, reuse reporting and CCP margin reporting, you are also reporting outstanding balances. So again, it's reporting on S plus one. Now a question that's come up here is, um, do you report what is actually settled or what should have settled? And the regulation requires actual, but in practice, you'll only be able to report what is intended because you won't know about fails of uh, failed deliveries in time to amend your reports. So our recommendation is you assume perfect settlement, you assume contractual settlement, um, you ignore fails. 
Um, a big decision to make when you're reporting is are you going to report at transaction level or position level? Now, in fact, we can simplify this decision for you. The rules around position level reporting, which only applies if you're dealing through a CCP, they, they don't work. So, in fact, position level reporting in practice is not available. Um, uh, you, you can't use it. So, um, the rules were written with a poor understanding of how CCPs work. So forget the bottom one, that only is going to apply to margin lending, it won't apply to repo or securities lending. So you'll be reporting all your repos as in the top half of this diagram, each repo has its own, own pool of collateral. Um, we'll come back to net collateral pools in a minute, but what I'm saying here is on the left hand side, those repos always exist as separate contracts, um, they are never merged into one position you know, on a contractual basis and therefore for a reporting purpose. Um, we've explained there why it doesn't work because the ESMA assumed that um, CCPs netted and then novated transactions into a single position. In fact, CCPs don't do that. They don't net down the contracts. Um, they only net the deliveries. So um, it's not going to work. Now, what, what do you report? Well, there are three types of report transactions, CCP margins and reuse, but the transaction reports have three sets of data attached to them, um, counterparty loan and collateral data. Uh, if you look in the RTSs and ITSs, in the annexes, you'll see there are four tables. Um, table one gives you the counterparty data, table two, the loan and collateral, and table three, CCP margin, table four, reuse. So you can identify what you've got to report in each of these. This is the total number of reports. Everybody will mention the global total of 155, but for repurchase transactions, it's a maximum 109 if you include margin and reuse, and for buy sell backs, it's a maximum 90 if you include margin and reuse. We're um, finding in our sample reports that typically it's between about 35 and 50 fields have to be filled out for fairly standard repos. Each field is going to have some um, obligation attached to it. Uh, a lot of fields are mandatory, you must fill them in. Some fields are conditionally mandatory, so if a certain validation rule applies, you'll find you have to fill the field in. So it might say, if you, field, if you fill in field three and four, you have to fill in field five. That's an example of when something would be conditionally mandatory. Some fields are optional, so you only populate it if applicable. That means basically, if it is adding extra information, to the other fields. If you don't fill in an optional field when you should, you'll be accused of under-reporting. And then anything's left blank, you don't have to fill in. In fact, you shouldn't fill in, fill in at all. Um, so when do you have to, sorry, when you start submitting your report, remember this is supposed to be a dual-sided reporting regime. If both parties are subject to SFTR, then the trade repositories, which is what we mean by the abbreviation TR, to whom you submit your reports, they will have to match them. And these matching requirements um, apply to an increasing number of fields. Ultimately, 75% of the fields um, of those 155 fields will be um, have to be matched. In the case of repo, remember it's slightly smaller. Now, as soon as reporting starts, 57 of fields for all SFTs and 43 for repo specifically are matching, and then that will gradually increase over time until by January 2023 the full 75% have to be matched. Some fields have tolerances, but they're very narrow. Anything involving a calculation or a percentage um, or a time, you, you're given a little bit of uh, leeway, but not very much. Okay, so let's look at the data itself. Counterparty data. Okay, I, this is, uh, we're trying to illustrate this by diagram. So let's start over on the left. You are the reporting counterparty. You have to give your LEI. Um, if you're dealing in a branch um, in, in another country, you have to give the country code of the branch. If you're dealing for somebody else, really the risk passes through you to somebody else, you have to report what's called a beneficiary. Now, in some cases, for example, mandatory delegated reporting, you won't be responsible. So if you're a mutual fund or a small NFC or you're a hedge fund, then remember the reporting requirement is delegated and it will go to somebody called the entity responsible for the report. If you're a normal operation, you will be both reporting counterparty and the entity responsible. Now, there is also this entity, the report submitting entity. This may be you, but you may have outsourced 
the reporting obligation to a third party provider, in which case 1.2 would be that provider. They have no regulatory responsibility. If something goes wrong with reporting, the regulator will come to see the entity responsible for the report. Um, the reporting counterparty, remember, is a buyer or a seller or a giver or taker of collateral. They're identified with this field 1.9 counterparty side. Your, your counterparty is over here, the other counterparty, and if they're dealing through a branch, remember you have to give the country code of their branch. In addition to counterparties, uh, well, just the basic information, we have to classify the counterparties. So here, nature of the reporting counterparty, who, what you are, you have to say whether you're financial or non-financial. And then you have to give your sector. Um, if you are financial, this will be what EU legislation you're authorised under. If you're non-financial, then the national account system of the EU will apply. And if you are um, a, a, what, if you come under this non-financial sector, if you're involved in financial activity of any form, but you're not, you're a non-financial entity, you will have to say whether you're a real estate investment trust. This is the additional sector classification. You'll also have to fill this in if you are a financial entity, but you are a USIT or an hedge fund. And then over on the other side, you'll have to give the country of the other counterparty. Now, if they're dealing through a branch, you've already given the country of the branch. This is the country of the parent. In addition to that, we have intermediary fields. So if we deal through an agent lender or a broker, then we have to report them. They do not have to report, but they probably have to provide a lot of information to you. Um, agent lenders are being interpreted in different ways. It's, this was really intended for securities lending. There's a dispute about what happens if the agent is lending cash because agent lender is normally interpreted as lending securities. We're still seeking clarification. A broker is not a voice broker. It is um, basically a broker dealer acting in the capacity of an agent for the particular transaction you're reporting. Again, a lot of confusion around this definition. In addition to the intermediaries, the infrastructures have to be reported. So if you use a tri-party agent, you have to give their LEI. If you're clearing um, on a CCP and you're using a clearing member to do that, you have to give their LEI. And then this last field is about how you settle your transaction. And we'll illustrate that. Um, I'll come back to that slide in a minute. Actually, we'll come back to that. In the end, I've left the slide rather late. So look, this is a list of those counterparties, reporting counterparty, entity responsible, report submitting entity, and beneficiary. Um, so you might have all, you have all four being reported um, to the trade repository. Uh, this bottom flow shows information being given back. That beneficiary, in the case of repo, you'll, it'll rarely be different from the reporting counterparty. If there's a trust structure, beneficiary may be different from reporting counterparty but we think this really applies to securities lending. Um, there's a little decision tree here to decide if you're the reporting counterparty are you also the entity responsible so I'll leave that for you to look through and then get back to brokers and agent then as I say there is confusion here um, so we are seeking further clarification. If you use a voice broker Okay, they will not be reported as a broker. We'll see how, what they reported as slightly later. Trading venue is um, in actually in the loan data, but I've included it here. You have to identify the trading venue. Now, if you're dealing on an electronic trading system, okay, that system will have what's called a MIC code, a market identifier code. You have to give that. If you're dealing OTC, you're not using an electronic platform, but then you register your deal with the platform, then you have to give this code X off. If you deal OTC and you never go near an electronic platform, then it's four X's. And if you deal through a voice broker that has an authorization in Europe as an OTF, then they will be treated as a trading venue. If the bro voice broker is not an OTF, we don't know how they're reported, if they're reported at all. The discussion continues. Tri-party agents, you give the LEI. If you're dealing in Sterling and you use a tri-party facility in the UK called DBV, that is a tri-party system, but that's a special indicator for that as well. You have to tick that box. And then the settlement, the point about this is that you, this is you, the reporting counterparty. If you're using a settlement agent, you report the nearest settlement agent to you. Don't report anything downstream towards the CSD. If you're settling directly with the CSD or ICSD, you don't report them, you report yourself. 
you never report a CSD or ICSD. We've talked about legal entity identifiers. This is a critical part of the reporting. We're facing a problem in that a number of counterparties don't have LEIs, particularly outside Europe, and we're looking for a solution, a transition solution to accommodate those sorts of counterparties. But there is pressure on EU entities to really only deal with counterparties that have LEIs. And in total, in a report, you'll need up to 10 LEIs. Remember, not just the counterparties, but also the intermediaries and the infrastructure. Now, loan data is um, all aggregated on this thing called the unique transaction identifier. This is really quite critical. Um, and it's a field of up to 52, it's a field of up to 52 alphanumeric characters. There is no further detail provided by ESMA about how this should be structured. We are at ICMA um, investigating the idea of providing um, a format. Um, for example, it should start with the LEI, the generator, and then include some further information, but uh, that work is, is continuing. Um, this field is going to link various reports together, so it is very important. It is unique to two pairs, of, to a pair of counterparties. It can't be corrected. It can only be destroyed or kept alive. Uh, it's mandatory in virtually every report, unless you collateralize on a net basis. So it's quite critical. Now, if you use a trading venue, a CCP, or a um, confirmation matching service, they have to generate the UTI for you. Okay, if you're not using any of those facilities, then you and your counterparty have to agree who is going to do that. And that can be quite a complicated process. And again, we are um, compiling some guidelines on how to approach that problem. Uh, you have to provide general information about your loan. This is the legal agreement you're using. And there are three fields there. So for example, typically 2.9 would be GMRA. 2.10 wouldn't have to bother about if it's GMRA, but 2.11, you'd have to say whether it was the 2000 or 2011 version. If it's an undocumented transaction, you say that the transaction is a master agreement type is other, and then you put detail down here. If you deal with a CCP, master agreement type is other because it's not on the list provided, and you put down that it's the CCP rule book that you're actually using to settle under. You then have to provide more general information how was the collateral provided? In the case of repo, it will always be title transfer. Okay, um, you don't have to bother to do this at all for, by sellbacks, the regulator accepts that's title transfer. Beware if you deal with domestic repo markets where a pledge is used, that's not a real repo. And is the collateral available for reuse? Well, if it's repo, it'll be title transfer, so it should be. Um, there's one exception, if you deal with a, um, an EU mutual fund, they cannot reuse collateral so they can't they, they won't be reporting available for reuse the initial report has to start off by saying is the transaction open or fixed and is it an evergreen or is it an extendable now there are two types of um, evergreen we've come across one where simply the notice period is longer than normal another one where it's a fixed term transaction but the maturity date moves automatically one day at a time until it's terminated. Um, in our sample reports, you can see how we've explained the reporting of these. Unfortunately, the validation rules that surround these transactions are um, not always correct, and we're waiting for those mistakes to be um, re resolved by ESMA. So read our recommendations and, and you'll see how we propose to get around those until they are corrected. There are fields uh, also, earliest callback date, minimum notice period. These cause a number of problems. If you had um, a, a fixed term transaction, what is the earliest callback date? Well, there isn't one. And if you have an, an open transaction, the earliest callback date changes every day. Do you have to report it every day as a, as a modification? We're suggesting not, but again, read the recommendations. Minimum notice period, that is also something that may have to, that um, could change. And it's defined in terms of calendar days, whereas when you get extended, sorry, it's defined in terms of business days, I beg your pardon, but for evergreens and extendables, it's defined in terms of calendar days. So what do you report? Um, again, we proposed a solution, but are seeking clarification from ESMA. Modifications and terminations. We've talked about modifications. If you change the contract terms other than collateral, that's under, we report collateral changes under a collateral update report, then you have to make a modification report. 
and this will include termination of the transaction where the settlement of the termination is not today. Uh, modifications have to be reported in chronological order, which is can be problematic. And then we talked about termination. You have to give an event date for each of your reports. And the um, big question has been, do you report when you decide to do something or do you report when it actually takes place? So if I decide to um, change the repo rate today, but the change won't effect, take effect on Monday, do I report Thursday or do I report Monday? So we've given our best interpretation in this table, collateral updates, margin update reports and reuse reports. Those are the codes for them. Okay, you report outstanding balances, so you must report after settlement. If it's a modification, then remember if it's a the modification is a termination that settles in the future, you are supposed to report it when you make the decision because that's when the contract changes and the risk changes. Other modifications, such as change the repo rate, they don't really have an impact until they take place. So you report the day in which they're the day in which they're implemented. Um, termination, the decision day and the settlement date are the same. If it's a new transaction, it's the transaction date. If it's a correction, you have to report the event date of the report you're correcting, and there is no correction, there's no event date for error reports, because the report shouldn't simply have existed. Um, you'll have to give repo rates. If it's fixed rate, that's fine. You can give the rate and um, the convention. If it's floating rate, there is a list. If there isn't a list, you have to write in the name yourself. And then you get these fields here. So you have to give the reference period. So if I talked about three months LIBOR, the reference period would be three months. Um, so field 226 says it's months, field 227 says it's three. Payment frequency, if I pay off, um, if I pay every month the interest, then it would be 228 would be month, 229 would be one. A lot of people do open transactions in which they don't pre-agree payment frequencies. This is a problem we're suggesting that you report monthly, just simply put a month in the report. And then reset frequencies, when is the interest rate changed? Usually it's the same frequency as the reference period, but it could be different. For example, overnight interest rates, um, no, sorry, I forget that example. Uh, it's usually the same as the reference period. So um, some problems with things like open floating rate, that's the sort of thing we, we, we discuss in our recommendations. Spread, you might be paying you only a plus five basis points. This would be the five basis points. The adjusted rate is the total. Now, the implication of SFTR is every time the index changes, you have to update it. So imagine using an overnight rate, you're sending in a, re a modification report every day. We've talked to ESMA about this. We believe they agree this shouldn't be done. Um, if it's a buy sell back, ESMA can't really make up their mind about how to report it. So they've said simply report the spot price of the collateral at the start of the transaction. This is actually not really giving you any information about a buy sell back, but that's what the regulator has asked for. Collateral data. You've got to start off your collateral report with some general information. Is it a GC repo or is it specific collateral? Now, our recommendation, which has been given by ESMA as one of the two options they're offering for consultation, is you should only report something as GC if you are using what's called a GC financing facility. So this is like Euro GC pooling offered by Eurex. This involves a CCP and a tri-party agent. Or if you're using the GC facility on an electronic platform, so electronic platforms offer you a way of registering deals that you negotiate bilaterally, bringing them onto the platform post-trade. If you use one of those, then this, uh, you select the collateral on the platform, you use that. And if you use a tri-party agent, we're saying every other case, it should be specific collateral. Um, ESMA have also asked people if they would like to use the level of the rate compared to the GC repo rate to fill out this field, but th we really don't think that's practical at all. So we're hoping the first option will be adopted. Um, then another general question, are you going to, rep does your at repo have its own pool of collateral, so trade level collateralization, or is there one pool of collateral for a portfolio of repos? So both of these will apply. Net exposure calculation is quite um, limited, but it does exist. If you're reporting at trade level, then you report everything together if you know the collateral by the time you're due to make your report. If you don't know what the collateral is by the time you're due to make the report. Uh, 
then you just report the loan data and in the a field called collateral basket identifier you either put the bar icing of the basket that you're going to allocate from or if you don't have an icing for that basket you put this ntav not available and then you'll be expected to follow up with a collateral update report that gives the collateral detail and you have to do that by remember s plus one net exposure calculation uh, remember gc financing facilities there are only three of them in europe um, there is another one in the us or if you have a tri-party repo managed by JP Morgan and then variation margining, this is the system that we've evolved to report variation margin on bilateral repo. So in other words, not through a CCP. Um, this doesn't exist in SFTR, so we've had to invent that. If you want to do this, you have to fill out these two fields. Now, this last field, value date of collateral, is a very confusing one. Um, it doesn't really make any sense. We're trying to get ESMA to deactivate that. The collateral itself, you can see the sorts of fields that are needed. I'm only going to pick out a couple of them. Price per unit and collateral market value. This is using the dirty price, so including accrued interest. And collateral market value does not include the haircut. The haircut itself, it says haircut or margin, they definitely mean haircut. So they don't mean um, a premium to the cash, they mean a discount from the collateral. Then the details of the security, this is the ISIN. Okay, there is an issue about lots of securities being used currently don't have an ISIN. Well, we're going to have to try and get hold of some or, or use some. We're looking for a solution again to transition um, from the current situation where there are large numbers of securities without ISINs to one where only ISINs are used. The LEI of the issuer is an even bigger problem. In fact, this is probably the biggest single problem we currently face with SFTR. There are lots of securities where the security may or may not have an ISIN, but the issuer doesn't have an LEI. And we're looking for a pragmatic solution to that. Um, but that discussion has only really just started with the regulators. The jurisdiction of the issuer, this is the parent. So if I was the financing subsidiary of Volkswagen, Volkswagen's in Germany, the financing subsidiary is in the Netherlands, I would actually put Germany here, even though the reporting counterparty would, or the security has been issued by a Dutch entity. Maturity of security only if it's bonds. Don't need it for equity. And then you put this strange date in if it's a perpetual bond. 31st of December, 9,999. Um, if you, uh, well, you will be for repo using securities as collateral. You then have to classify them using a CFI code. This is an ISO code. You can see an example there, DBFTFB. Um, only the first two letters are mandatory, but you'll be expected to fill out the others if they apply. And ESMA is currently saying only use official sources. And there is a database in the EU called FERS, which you can apply to, but it is currently incomplete. So we're asking that this can be synthesized in that case. Collateral quality, investment grade or non-investment grade, basically. But ESMA want everybody to use their internal credit assessments. Banks are very resistant to this. And so, again, we're having a discussion about how that can be done. And then collateral type, this is for the FSB. You can see the eight categories there. We only have definitions of three. And this is, again, going to be another problem. So this is a real challenge of SFTR, that not only do you report what you've done, you have to classify things like counterparties and collateral. If you have cash as collateral in repo, which does occur very infrequently, okay, you'll have to report it as part of the collateral update. But it usually is only an intraday holding uh, process. Um, you don't have to go on to report this for reuse as, as we'll see. Okay, so CCP cleared repo. Well, we've got about two minutes to go in the official time. We're probably going to overrun by about five minutes, but um, don't worry. Let's make sure we complete. CCP cleared repo. Um, if you deal with the CCP, there will be something called a portfolio code. Um, you have to report that. If you've actually margining with a CCP and your margin includes non-SFTs like derivatives, okay, you'll already have a code under the EMEA regulation, you report that. And if you are paying or receiving margin that is for both SFTs and derivatives or other assets, you don't break it up when you report it under SFTI, you just report the whole thing. Uh, report tracking number is a quite a confusing concept. So if you deal with a CCP, then the regulations assume that you start off with a transaction between the parties before clearing. This is called the prior repo. And then that transaction is broken up into 
two repos, one from me to the CCP and another from the CCP to you through the process of novation, except when clearing is done through open offer. Now, open offer is only used these days by Euro GC pooling. So virtually everybody else uses everybody else uses novation. So this is the general rule. You have to assume that you have this bilateral repo, the prior repo, which is then replaced by two cleared repos. Okay, now, the UTI of the prior repo is referred to as the report track, tracking number. So if you trade on a trading venue, they will give you a UTI for your trade, and then you treat that as the RTN, and then you'll get new UTIs from the CCP once the transaction is cleared. Now, we have an example here of how it works. So let's say down here, I trade on a, sorry, I beg your pardon, top, we trade on a trading venue, and uh, if it's open offer, we don't have to worry about the prior repo. So we just use the UTIs given to us by the CCP when we make our reports. If it's not open offer, if we're using a trading venue and it's cleared the same day, the trading venue gives us a UTI for the trade which is assumed to exist between us. We report that as the RTN, then the CCP will give us a UTI that we also include in the report. If we're not using a trading venue, we will have to agree the RTN ourselves. There's a table here that describes what you have to do. So use of a trading venue, an open offer, there's no prior repo, there's no RTN, so that's fine. Use of a trading venue, same day novation, there is a prior repo, but you don't have to report it. You, but you do have to report the RTN, who generates it, the trading venue. And then everything else, there will be a prior repo, you will have to report it and you will have to give an RTN as well. If there's no trading venue involved, then it's up to the parties to agree it. Um, margin data, this is only for CCP cleared margin. So uh, if you are dealing with a CCP because you're a clearing member or if you're dealing with a clearing client, then variation margin, initial margin and excess collateral has to be reported, not default fund contributions. The numbers that are reported by clearing members will be given to them by the CCP. It'll be a single number for initial margin, a single number for variation margin, and a single number for excess collateral in one currency. So it's actually quite easy for clearing members. They just wait for the CCP to give them um, the information. The first time you make a margin report, you put this newt action type, and every subsequent one, you use this maru action type. Um, reuse. So, reuse of collateral under SFTR. If you receive collateral okay, through an SFT and you use it through an SFT, that is reuse. The rules also say that if you are borrowing and lending through securities lending, that also has to be included. But if you receive collateral through an SFT from a European Central Bank or the ECB, you don't include that. If you give it to one of those entities, you don't include that. So we've got a table here on the left-hand side, collateral you're receiving um, it, that is available for reuse that you have to include in the calculation. And on the right-hand side, the reuse itself. So we're interested in repo and securities lending. We're interested in collateral received as variation margin. The rest is all about securities lending and borrowing. Remember to exclude collateral from members of the European system of central bank. And then on the other side, it's a mirror image. If you're dealing with securities lending, then you have to worry about security interests, um, but that's uh, not what we're gonna focus on today. Now, you report reuse for each ISIN that you receive and reuse, okay? And it's gotta be done by S plus one because you're reporting the balance of reuse. And remember, this is one exception. You've got to report an intra-company cross-border reuse between a parent and a foreign branch. Now, most people keep their securities in omnibus accounts. So we have our, if I buy a security outright and I receive it through a repo, then they go into the same account. And I can't distinguish when I reuse them, whether I use the one I bought outright or the one that I got through an SFT. In that case, you don't report it under this field 4.8 because you don't know where the collateral came from. You use this field, this formula here for estimated reuse. Now, just to simplify how that works, imagine that I actually bought 10 million of Security X outright. I reversed in five through a reverse repo, but not from an EU central bank. 
and then I use six of that 15 as collateral in another SFT. So it's the five I received over the 15 total I hold. That's a ratio of one third. And if I've reused six, then I estimate that of that six, two is being reused, is collateral being reused. Not a particularly useful number, but that's what the regulators want. Okay, so we've um, got to the end. Uh, one thing I perhaps should mention is variation margin. We do have uh, a proposal for how that's going to be reported if it's not CCP cleared. This is basically a collateral update report in which you would uh, report variation margin for the whole portfolio of your repo. 